have been held, no? Yeah. And uh, Dinath has got a uh, thousand beds. So uh, out of the thousand, we have got 400 for COVID. Okay. Wow. 40%. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. So, hmm. I think uh, let's get going now. Uh, yeah. People uh, will keep joining. Uh, we started live on the YouTube as well, so it's time to go ahead. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen and colleagues. Today is the next episode of IGMPO Talks. Uh, as, as all you are aware, ISMPO and IGMPO have taken a lead and uh, we invite uh, experts in various fields from all over India as well as globe to talk with us and uh, guide us about their area of expertise. Today we have a dear friend um, and a colleague who um, has studied with me uh, in Pune from BJ Medical College then has worked in Tata Memorial Hospital for some period of time, then worked and studied in UK. And finally, he's been working as a consultant, consultant hematologist and BMT physician in Peter McCallum, which is like a Tata Memorial Hospital of Australia and a Royal Melbourne Hospital in Melbourne. Uh, he would be talking with us about myeloma immunotherapy update. As you all know, uh, he would be giving uh, his talk, which would be streamed live on the YouTube. All the mics are expected to be on mute. If you don't keep the mics mute, I will be forced you to remove from the talk because it disturbs the decorum and disturbs the talk. Please uh, keep uh, questions flowing in uh, in the chat box. It is 11.30 p.m. Uh, in Australia, so we would be able to take few questions, uh, time permitting. So uh, keep the questions flowing, but ask uh, intelligent and few questions. With that, uh, let's get going. Uh, Dr. Amit, uh, uh, over to you. Please start your talk. Uh, thanks, Padmaj, and uh, thanks for the invitation and um, and for organizing this event. Was very um, happy to to receive the invite and to see um, 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 all the educational opportunities that you're providing to uh, um, across the country. Um, and uh, also gives me an opportunity to share some of the experience that um, I've developed over the last well 15 years of treating myeloma, really. Um, since 2004, and, um, I've, and and seeing the huge change that's happened over the last 15 years in this field. So I, I'm um, a hematologist and um, with a special interest in myeloma and transplant. So I'll be talking, there's a lot of slides and I'll, I'll see how we go with uh, regards to time. Um, as I said, Padman has said, they, they will be available um, if, uh, if required for more detail. And um, but anyway, I, I want to cover um, the the themes of the talk, um, which um, which is short overview. We'll talk about newly diagnosed myeloma, both transplant eligible and non-transplant eligible. I'll pick a few studies to to make some points about uh, um, how we're progressing with immunotherapy in this field. We'll talk about relapsed refractory myeloma, and um, uh, the exciting developments that are happening in that area and also a brief touch on uh, supportive care, um, which, um, which we don't routinely associate with uh, immunotherapy, um, but uh, there is uh, some exciting developments in that uh, area as well. So let's, if we look at the, um, um, I just want to confirm, uh, but my, the screen's moving okay? Um, and, and you can see it all okay? Yeah, but I can see as it's going well. Yeah, it's yeah. going well. Okay, good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if, if we look at myeloma therapy um, and progress in myeloma therapy, um, pretty much uh, modern therapy began in the 60s with the develop uh, with malflan and prednisolone, which really nothing was superior, proved to be superior to that simple combination for 40 years, um, other than the addition of autologous transplant in the 90s. 
the paradigm shifted in the um, at the turn of the century with the addition of thalidomide into the treatment armamentarium and so the the proteasome inhibitors and the imids really um, uh, in in various iterations and generations um, uh, ruled the roost for about 20 years and it's been the last five years that immunotherapy has really taken off so the immunotherapy revolution started off with uh, daratumumab um, in around 2015-2016. Um, we've had denosumab, which I'll talk about further in the supportive therapy space. And now we've got uh, a number of um, uh, number of agents with um, isotuximab, um, ilutuzumab, um, daratumumab uh, subcut formulation. So, so it, the field's progressing very rapidly in the last five years. Now, if, if you look at the immunotherapy options available, there's quite a few. I mean, if, I mean the, the IMIDs are immunomodulatory agents. We, we, we know they have profound actions on the immune system, the microenvironment. And so that already told us uh, about uh, the immune system being very important in the therapy for, for myeloma and, and that we had to look beyond chemotherapy drugs. The other treatment option, which is allogeneic stem cell transplant, we've had that around for 30 or 40 years. And we know that some patients, not, not, not a lot, but some patients do benefit long-term from allograft in myeloma and the effects of donor lymphocyte infusion have been clearly documented in patients with myeloma. So, um, so again, there was a pointer towards um, immunotherapy being effective in myeloma. What's uh, really changed the paradigm is the um, targeted agents against CD38, SLAM F7 or CS1, which is elitusumab. Surprisingly, the checkpoint innovators, which um, have uh, been revolutionary in solid tumor oncology, have not been that effective in myeloma, and it's still not very clear um, at this stage as to why that why that is. We've got some uh, antibody drug conjugates targeting BCMA, and again, I'll cover that. Um, the exciting area now is the bispecific um, T cell engagers, the bites, and um, the bispecific NK cell engagers, the bikes. And, um, and also now we've got um, adoptive T cell therapy with CAR T cells. And, um, and, um, CAR NK cells as well, which we'll, um, we'll talk about briefly as well. Now, cell, uh, vaccine, um, myeloma vaccines have been trialed for, I mean, in fact, they were amongst the first immune therapy options along with interferon, which were trialed in the myeloma field. And they've been around for a long time now. The, the peptide-based vaccines haven't worked very well. Um, and there's been no evidence of efficacy in that area. But in the cell-based vaccines, dendritic cell vaccines may hold a role, and um, there is a phase three trial ongoing, but I won't be covering that today. So if you look at uh, the mechanism of action of immunomodulatory drugs, the, uh, I mean, the, the, what I always find interesting about the IMIDs is that the, um, the initial treatment was very empirical, empirically based, Nobody knew what the target was. Um, some pre, uh, laboratory studies had shown evidence of efficacy. That's why the drugs were tried. And they were found to be very effective and, and caused a paradigm shift away from chemotherapy treatment in myeloma. They have profound actions on the immune system, including um, uh, actions on NK cells. They prime the action of NK cells uh, against myeloma. And that's been known about for a while along with actions on the microenvironment. Now, it's only been the last uh, five years or so that uh, the cellular target, which is cerebron, um, has been defined, and uh, which leads to the, the cytotoxic action of the immunomodulatory group of drugs. But um, um, also, uh, um, there are, we, we still don't know exactly a, a lot of the mechanisms of how um, myeloma targets the, the immune system or how it modulates the immune system. And, and now there is this next generation of drugs called the cell mods, uh, which seem to be even more potent. 
Now, coming to diatrimumab, it has the, the anti-CD38 uh, um, agent, which has caused the next shift or paradigm shift in myeloma therapy. It, it has actions, the usual actions of all monoclonal antibodies, um, CDC, ADCC, um, and, and causing direct um, apoptosis of the, um, of the myeloma cell. But it does cause profound effects on the immune system as well. And this is particularly seen in, um, in the maintenance setting. All daratumumab treatment trials now have maintenance arms. And that is um, often when the myeloma has already responded is actually present in, in, in very low levels in the marrow or in the extramedullary state. So, um, and so that's when um, um, the, the action on the immune system uh, um, in terms of increase in numbers of helper T cells, depletion of um, immunosuppressive cells and, and clonal expansion of cytotoxic T cells, th those, um, those mechanisms of actions are important at, in, in the maintenance setting. I'm gonna talk about that there's, an, I mean, daratumumab has been now being added to every anti-myeloma agent uh, and the trials with every combination. There's a whole alpha boot soup of trials um, now available. And um, I'll, I'll talk about one of them, which is the uh, Dara VMP um, study, which is one of the more mature ones. So, so now we'll, we'll move on to transplant eligible um, newly diagnosed disease. And one of the um, studies that was presented uh, has um, uh, data maturing um, is the Griffin study, which was presented at ASH last year. So this is a, um, a one is to one randomization between daratumumab RVD versus RVD um, for four cycles. And then there is a, um, a, both arms get transplanted. There's two cycles of consolidation. And then there's a maintenance arm with um, the Dara arm getting um, uh, Dara rev maintenance and um, and the versus rev maintenance alone for two years. So um, I mean this is this is pretty much RVD transplant, RVD consolidation, and our, our maintenance would be considered standard of care um, today. Um, um, but that's rapidly going to change with uh, with the results that we're seeing we're seeing with the addition of daratumumab as as we'll talk about. The primary endpoint was stringent CR. Um, so now all myeloma trials now, uh, the, the endpoints are changing because even a PFS endpoint is um, uh, is often too difficult to, to show a difference between two arms because the um, time required for the trial to um, um, uh, to run will, is, is over five, somewhere between five and seven years. So if you want to do quicker trials, um, you have to choose endpoints like um, stringent CR or MRD negativity, and a lot of myeloma trials are moving towards those um, towards those endpoints. So the, these um, these early, um, early results from this trial are very promising for daratumumab. So you can see across um, every time point of myeloma treatment, end of induction, end of transplant, end of consolidation, the Dara arm is superior. And there is a um, stringent um, um, a CR rate of about 80% um, um, at, um, at the clinical cutoff, which was uh, about 22, 22 months um, from randomization. So that uh, to get um, a, CR, a greater than CR rate of 80% is, um, is exceptional when you look at the evolution of myeloma therapy, the initial Malflan and prednisolone, we started off with a CR rate of 4%. Now uh, we've got to 80%. So um, significant progress. Uh, I'm not going to talk about cost of treatment here, but at least in terms of um, uh, just looking at uh, the, the endpoints of uh, response, or just, uh, they have, we've made significant progress over, over 40 years. Um, there, there, there is a um, small difference in the PFS curve, and the, as expected, not much difference in the overall survival curve. But a 95% overall survival at the two-year mark is pretty good, and a 95% uh, um, progression-free survival at two years is also is also very good. 
So um, the, um, the take home message from the study is that uh, this is likely to become the standard of the next standard of care for once the, um, uh, the results mature. And the, the problem with daratumumab is the uh, logistically it's difficult to deliver because of the um, frequent need for intravenous therapy, um, lots of infusion related reactions, particularly early on. So the PERSIS study is looking at subcutaneous daratumumab. And uh, uh, and if, and we already know that uh, subcutaneous diatomumab is as effective as IV. So once the results of that study come through, it's likely that subcut dara um, with RVD is going to be the standard of care. Okay. Now, if we, we, we all think that um, cofilzomib is a, a more potent drug than, or a more effective drug than um, Valcade or bortezomib. So, um, but, um, particularly in the second line or relapsed refractory setting, um, cafilzomib is now considered before Valcade um, in most cases. So, um, it makes it seems to be logical to to trial it in in frontline therapy now. Um, in another discussion today from the recent ASCO meeting, I think there were some results of the Kofelzomib Revdex versus um, Valcade Revdex study, um, uh, which were which were presented, and they don't seem to be, there doesn't seem to be too much difference, at least uh, a, in the frontline setting between that combination. So, so it's interesting to to see how um, uh, KRD Dara will um, will. Uh, Compare with VRD Dara. Now there is a there is a phase two study which is being done in the U.S. with the KRD combination um, with Dara, and it's interesting because in this um, in this study, the investigators or the treating physicians had the option of whether to transplant or not. All, all patients received eight cycles of KRD and DARA and, um, and it, the, in, the, the patients were not to be transplanted um, as, as a in, in first line. Now they had a very interesting endpoint which was MRD negativity after eight cycles of KRD DARA and they reached that um, um, that milestone in seventy seven percent of patients. Now that is uh, that is an amazing um, number to get close to eighty percent MRD negative after eight cycles and an overall response rate of one hundred percent. I haven't seen a myeloma trial. It is the first trial that I've seen that has a, an overall response rate of one hundred percent. So this is phase two study. The results will will not be as good when uh, in a phase three, but still it is, these, these are impressive results early on. And again, the uh, uh, MRD negativity seems to be reached in most patients by cycle six of treatment. So if you look at limited durations of treatment, if MR, if we, uh, as we know, MR, reaching MRD negativity means that uh, patients are going to have a very long progression free interval. This offers the possibility of limiting um, the duration of treatment to, to, if most patients are going to get MRD negativity by cycle eight, then maybe that's all the treatment that's required. And uh, then patients uh, could have a long treatment break. And then um, uh, maybe after four, five, six years, um, have the next line of therapy. So it's very, very interesting um, that uh, a, a lot of interesting questions that this study raises. So the, there was a summary slide looking at MRE negativity across these various, um, various studies, BRD Dara and KRD Dara versus KRD alone. And I mean, um, if you look at the Forte study with KRD eight cycles. With transplant, there is a 58% uh, MRD negativity rate. In this, this study, without transplant, we get 70%, 77% uh, MRD negative. So again, the, this is a, uh, every other study where 
which is compared transplant versus no transplant has always um, ended up in favor of the transplant arm. Maybe with this combination, transplant may not be needed. So that is going to be the next question that's going to be asked. Now, the, one of the things that um, uh, amazes me about the role of allogenic transplant in myeloma is that uh, uh, every few years um, a, in the myeloma community, everybody talks about allogenic transplant being um, uh, a thing of the past, but then somebody comes up with a new analysis or a new study showing that there may still be a role. And so at the, the last ASH meeting, there was a meta-analysis of uh, four trials of auto-auto versus auto-allo in newly diagnosed patients with, uh, with myeloma. And because all these studies were all done in the 90s and um, early 2000s, there, there is long follow-up available, all for, for relatively younger patients in their, uh, uh, with median age in the early 50s. And with diff different types of conditioning regimens, um, different types of graft versus disease prophylaxis. But uh, the, the slides are interesting, very interesting. Um, as expected, there is a higher non-relapse mortality due to graft versus host disease infection in the in the um, auto allo group. The progression-free survival is not different, uh, and and these are survival curves that go out to ten years, so extended follow-up. At least statistically, the, there isn't a significant difference in the PFS, but as there is a. a at the 10-year mark, there is a significant difference in, in the overall survival, 44% versus 36%. And there is a plateauing of the curve. Maybe about 20% of uh, patients are cured with an allograft. I mean, they, so uh, it's, it's an interesting concept. Um, I, I, even though being a transplanter myself, I still I transplant very few patients with uh, allograft, very few patients with myeloma now. But it, it, it does show that there, if all, if we hadn't developed all these other therapies in the last twenty years, um, allograft may still have had a role in in myeloma. Okay, so let's talk about um, the non-transplant eligible group, and we'll come to the Alcyon study, which again is the most mature um, when it comes to combining diatomumab with the standard of care, which is in the European setting is bortezomib, melphalan, and prednisolone, which uh, has pretty much been a standard for, in, for older patients with myeloma in Europe for more than 10 years. And it's, it's, good, it's good treatment, it's well tolerated, and um, um, quite effective. So this study compared nine cycles of VMP versus nine cycles of Darrow VMP and then um, uh, and then Darrow maintenance post um, post Darrow VMP with a primary P PFS endpoint. So again this study because it has a PFS endpoint is going to take much longer to um, uh, to mature. There were well-matched groups in, in, in across both, and about 20%, um, 15 to 20% um, high risk um, in in the two arms. Now, this this is interesting. This slide of progression-free survival because this the curve starts separating very early on. Now, most studies, if you, if you look at most studies in myeloma. Um, I mean, for example, the first study, which is um, MP versus um, um, Revlimid dexamethasone, the the curve starts separating um, not in the in the first year, but in the uh, in the second year when maintenance therapy with Revlimid uh, um, uh, seems to make the difference. Here, the curve starts separating very early on, so it's not the maintenance therapy, or it's not uh, in the maintenance uh, area where the difference is. Um, a, it's a, we can start seeing a significant benefit for daratumumab um, pretty much almost from day one. And um, uh, if you look at uh, a 42 month PFS is 48% versus 14%. I mean, we don't even need to calculate the stats to, to know that that's significant. 
And again, the MRD negativity is significantly uh, uh, better um, in an older group of patients without transplant to get 30, close to 30% MRD negativity um, at 40 months is very impressive. Overall survival benefit as well, uh, which uh, this was secondary endpoint, but uh, uh, significant overall survival benefit, which in these days, I mean, very rarely do you see that in a study. And again, interestingly, in for uh, the PFS2, which is progression um, after um, relapse, that, I mean, those benefits are maintained longer term as well. So this, uh, again, for it, it looks like we're going to have standard of care daratumumab addition to whichever combination is chosen, BRD, VMP, uh, uh, CVD. It, any, any sort of combination is going to benefit with the, um, with the addition of daratumumab, and we'll see all those studies read out over the next few years. Okay, let's talk about um, um, relapsed refractory myeloma, and, um, and that... A revolution is being led by the um, agents targeted against BCMA, B cell maturation antigen. So this is expressed mainly or pretty much exclusively on plasma cells and myeloma cells. And, um, and it has different, um, the amount of BCMA expressed is different, but doesn't seem to correlate with, uh, with the response rates. So it's like a lot of... Um, targeted therapies, we still don't know exactly how much of the target needs to be expressed on the tumor cell for efficacy. And that's that's similar um, in, in BCMA. And BCMA is required for myeloma cell um, survival and, and also has actions on the on the microenvironment of the bone marrow. Um, so it's it's it targets a number of um, so, um, Areas where um, of areas where um, the, of survival for the uh, myeloma cell, and is there's a number of ways in which um, it's being used as a target. So this is a study where I'm an investigator. It's called the Dream Six study, um, where um, belantamide mafodo mafodotin, which is a drug antibody conjugate. Is, um, is being used in combination with uh, lenalidomide um, or bortezomib in the study. Now the phase one single agent studies with this agent, which is called Belmaf now, has shown the phase initial phase one study had shown an exceptional overall response rate of 60% in very heavily pretreated patients. The phase two study, which led to its registration in the US um, as a so, possibly a more realistic response rate of about 30%. But again, in, in heavily pretreated patients, these are pro proteasome inhibitor and image refractory and previously treated with a CD38 antibody to get a, um, a response rate of 30% is pretty good. So um, could that be improved with combination? That's what this study is looking at. The um, it's a dose escalation study um, in co combination with uh, bortezomib and lenalidomide, and the results of the combination with bortezomib were presented at ASCO. And just ASCO just gone. Now the interesting thing with um, I'm finding with all drug antibody conjugates is that they have um, some often unexpected toxicities with uh, in the hematologic cancer space with brentuximab, there was neuropathy, with um, gemtuzumab, bozogamycin, in AML, there was hepatotoxicity. And this agent has a, a toxicity on the cornea. So uh, it causes a keratopathy. And that is at least practically um, um, a, a difficult area to manage because you have to give a lot of treatment breaks to these patients now. So future development of this molecule is um, is being, uh, there's going to be different dosing schedules and possibly combinations with other agents which might help with this, um, with this toxicity. So a significant number of, um, uh, of patients had in, in the DREAM2 study, 69 out of 85 had um, 
had keratopathy. So it is something that uh, we will need to, to manage going forward. But the, the response rates are pretty good. So 80% overall response rate when combined with, um, with bortezomib. Now, uh, the eligibility for the criteria for this trial had patients across um, anywhere from uh, one line, one anywhere from one prior line of therapy to, to any number of prior lines of therapy. So it's a, it's a pretty um, heterogeneous group of patients, but still we, there's a, a, at least the early data is quite encouraging. And uh, we're hoping that we'll present the lenalidomide data in, uh, in ASH uh, in December. So um, I, there are other, other agents in the space as well, which uh, the early studies are starting to recruit now. So it'd be an interesting area to see how um, it will stack up against this next group of agents, the bite antibodies or the bispecific T cell engages. Now, these agents are designed to overcome the immune surveillance um, um, or the failure of immune surveillance, which happens in myeloma. And like all bites, they um, attach the tumor cell to a T cell, which causes the expansion of the T cells. And these, these induce apoptosis of the tumor cell. So um, this is the first in-class molecule called AMG420. And like blinitumumab in ALL, this has to be given as a continuous infusion for four weeks, which is pretty difficult logistically. Um, and this, this is the um, study which, uh, which was the phase one. And it did show a very good response rate, overall response rate of 70%. Again, with uh, some MRD negative uh, patients. Now, th these are very heavily pretreated patients, and to to see responses which um, are MRD negative is uh, again has only been seen in the immunotherapy space. None of the PIs and IMIDs um, were able to do this. So obviously, we are seeing responses which we have never seen before in myeloma. Now the next agent also from Amgen is 701, which has a, a once in three week dosing schedule. And there's a large, largish phase two, phase one, two study um, recruiting. And we, we're doing that study and we have seen again, exceptional responses in patients who have had seven, eight lines of therapy prior, autologous allotransplant, everything, no, no, no therapy remaining have gone on to the study and have had MRD negative um, responses maintained for more than two years. So one of my patients has now been MRD negative for more than two years on this study after eight prior lines of therapy. So I think um, uh, this is the agent which is likely to move forward because it's got a much more convenient uh, dosing schedule. Now there are other agents in the space. This was another, um, another agent whose results were presented at ASH. They call it a two plus one because it's a bi it's got a bivalent um, anti BCMA. Um, uh, it, it targets a BCMA in a in a bivalent mechanism, and it's supposed to be more potent. And um, it has one epitope which does not bind to complement, which what uh, which is the the other bites do, and this may help with reducing um, uh, toxicities such as infusional toxicities. And they presented um, early results of this uh, of uh, of this agent. Again, it's delivered um, on a day one eight fifteen twenty two schedule, which is, is more convenient than a daily or a continuous twenty eight day dosing um, regimen. And um, it, I mean, this is the safety slide. You can see that these agents are pretty potent. And we have to learn to, to manage toxicity because there is one grade five CRS toxicity here. Now that is, so that's a treatment related death. And um, uh, we, it, it just shows how potently these agents um, stimulate the immune system that you can get a grade five event from um, immune stimulation. The majority of agents are, uh, the majority of events are grade uh, one and two, 
So, and, and manageable with users of using steroids and occasionally need tocilizumab. But um, uh, th this is something that we will have to learn to manage uh, along the way with these agents is the CRS. So you can see here, 70, 75% of patients needed um, corticosteroid use and about less, little less than half needed tocilizumab. Now, um, yeah, this was a dose escalation study. So um, as the more effective doses have been reached, 11 out of 13 uh, patients responded. And those responses are, are being maintained longer term. Uh, this, this is the other thing with the bites, which as we talk about when we talk about the CAR T cells, is that uh, the, the responses in the patients who respond, the, um, a lot of them maintain their responses long term. So, um, so again, the, the take home message from the patients who, when the more effective doses are being reached, we're seeing overall response rates of um, close to 90% with the 44% stringent CR or CR rate. Okay, let's talk about uh, the CAR T cell space, which I, 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 left, I left this for last because um, I, I I mean, everybody only wants to talk about CAR T cells these days, but in in the my, myeloma space, it comes with a lot of caveats. I, it, it, they are very effective, but um, there are caveats. So let's. Uh, I'm not going to go into the the constructs or uh, and all that information's out there and it's now well commonly known. But this is the most uh, advanced. CAR in myeloma, which targets BCMA, and it's uh, it's it's BB2121. All of them are unpronounceable names, so I'm not going to try and pronounce it. But um, uh, it's got uh, the anti-BCMA tumor binding domain with uh, a transmembrane CD8 linker and a co-stimulatory 41BB domain, um, which is linked to the CD3 zeta. So that's pretty much all cars are constructed like this uh, and there are differences in the co-stimulatory domains and obviously the tumor binding domains. Now, the, the three studies which in myeloma, which um, are the most advanced um, in the recruitment um, are summarized here. Um, they're all very heavily pretreated with between five and six lines, uh, median prior lines of therapy significant numbers of extramedullary disease, which is always a, a marker of more difficult myeloma, more advanced myeloma, and significant tumor burden. There are differences in their constructs, differences in their cell doses. They, they all have uh, issues with um, cytokine release syndrome, and these, the next two agents in the pipeline, the which is in the cartitude one and the, the Janssen molecule and the Orva capture gene, which is the evolved study, they seem to be more potent. And, um, and so the uh, CRS and the neurological events um, are uh, maybe more of an issue in these, um, in, with these agents. They also cause HLH or um, hemophagocytosis or macrophage activation syndrome, and particularly these, uh, the second and third agents in the pipeline, they seem to be more prone to um, uh, these problems. And therefore, you can see more use of steroids and, um, and tocilizumab as compared to BB2121. But, but this is, I suppose, the, the important slide where We've got uh, stringent CR rates of 86% uh, with the Janssen CAR within the Cartitude study. Now that again for six prior lines of therapy is, is an amazing figure uh, to get 86% um, greater than CR rate and 81% MRD negativity. So in, encouraging uh, response rates, but what I've not shown is the um, pro the progression-free survival curve. In the BB2121 study, which has the most patients, more than 120 patients in the Karma 1 study, the most patients have uh, relapsed at a year. 
So there is no, and there's no plateauing in the curve. So that is, um, that is a problem. And in, at least in the myeloma space, um, different strategies will need to be evolved to deal with this high rate of, of uh, relapse. There are numbers of studies going on, they're summarized in that slide. Now, to address that problem of relapse, there is this next construct, which is uh, BB21217, where the cells are cultured with the PR3 kinase inhibitor. And this produces a product which has a, a memory phenotype, a, a more of a memory-like phenotype, which may improve persistence of the cars and hopefully improve the progression-free interval. There's a number of other targets in preclinical development targeting CD70, CD56, 38, 138. It, there's a whole lot of um, targets that are being developed. So we'll, we'll just talk uh, a little bit about uh, the details of these studies. So the slide that I showed with the, um, the summary slide with the Janssen uh, CAR T cell was originally developed in China. It was, uh, the, the, I think the company was called Legend. And this was interesting because the Chinese study that did, um, that was the first to use this construct was actually in patients who were not as heavily pretreated. Um, and there were certain other differences there. Leukodepletion step only has cyclophosphamide Pretty much across most CAR T cell studies, the leukodepletion uses fludarabine and cyclophosphamide. This one had only cyclo. And um, when we look at the patient population, as I said, the median prior lines of therapy was only three opposed to, as opposed to five to six in the other studies. And uh, a lot of the patients were, um, had only exposure to either an image or uh, a PI uh, only. So they were not as heavily pretreated. And only less than 20% had had a prior autograph. And so what, when we look at the results of that study, it, it's showing a 74% um, response rate or complete response rate with a reasonable number of patients, 57, with nearly 70% uh, MRE negative. So, and those responses are being maintained over a period of time. So median duration of response in patients with CR is 29 months. So it does look like if the, if the cars are used early on in myeloma treatment, uh, they may be more effective. I suppose that holds true for any, any treatment in oncology. So it's, it's, but it's interesting to see this, um, see this phenomenon. But the other interesting thing is that, um, uh, and, and that again, in, when you look at most CAR T cell study data, CAR Ts don't seem to, pro, uh, uh, at least are not detectable long-term in the blood or tumor compartment or, or wherever you're studying it. So again, here only four patients had um, CAR T cells in the blood for more than 10 months, but still continue to maintain, maintain the response. So, and so these are the survival curves which show that at um, uh, 30 months, the um, PFS is nearly 50% if, um, if you achieve a CR. If you don't achieve a CR, you will progress in less than a year. So the key is to, to, to get that CR. And, uh, um, and then this it was taken forward into this cartridge. The same construct was taken forward into the cartridge study in the US. And um, these patients were uh, in their inclusion criteria, they were more heavily pretreated. They had to have a prior PI image and anti CD38. And so there were uh, <laughs> patients with three to 18 lines of therapy. I, I, I still struggle to work out how someone can receive 18 lines of therapy, but it's there. Um, and majority of the patients are getting grade one to two. Um, CRS events, but manageable. And there is again one grade five event here. So, so that uh, a note of caution is always required. But these are a waterfall plot, which an investigator would only dream of where everybody has responded and the majority have had a complete response. So um, that, that is very, very encouraging. 
and this is just some more um, uh, response data. And a significant number of patients were um, MRD negative, depending on what level of MRD was chosen. Or even if you choose the, the highest level of MRD, um, 10 raised to minus six, more than 50% of patients were um, MRD negative at that level. So, so this holds a lot of promise. Now, I, I'm, I'm going to skip these slides in the interest of time, but this is just from the um, uh, the 21217 study, the, which we hope will the the CAR T cells will last longer in the blood, and uh, and produce more prolonged responses. And so, uh, again, in this study, as the higher doses or the more effective doses of uh, cell doses are reached, most patients respond. And, and um, these, at least at those levels, does the progression-free survival curves um, and the probability of response improves. There are some, uh, as, uh, as I mentioned earlier, some other targets being studied in um, CD19, CD138. The CD19 target, um, like in lymphoma, there's, you can see some responses there. The other two, CD138 and the light chain target, targeted CAR T's, there's some stable diseases, but not as, at least uh, when compared to 100% responses with the uh, BCMA CARs, doesn't seem that encouraging in early data. Now, lastly, to, to end with, I'm just going to talk about denosumab. So it's always interesting to me that uh, uh, about development of myeloma therapy, um, I, the, the first big change that we saw when it came to supportive care was when zoldronic acid became standard of care for, um, for management of skeletal related or prevention of skeletal related events. But um, the myeloma 9 study, um, which led to that, that change was a study which I, I've recruited patients to. And it was interesting because that study was only designed to work out a benefit for skeletal related events. But when the survival data was looked at, um, there was a difference in survival, an improvement in survival for patients who received Zometa versus those patients who received Claudronate. And that actually became the biggest reason for a shift to, there was some difference in the um, um, skeletal related events as well as compared to Claudronate. But the, the difference in survival between the two uh, arms really led to um, the Zometa becoming the standard of care. So this study was designed for, to, to look at as a non-inferiority study, um, to look at denosumab versus Zometa in, in myeloma for skeletal related events. And because it was a non-inferiority study, it was very large, uh, 1,700 patients recruited, more than 850 in each arm. And again, uh, there's there's no difference um, when it comes to um, skeletal related events, the two agents are comparable. But again, when the survival curves were looked at, there was a difference of about 10 months between the um, denosumab arm and, um, and the Zometa arm. And when those groups were subdivided in various ways in the transplant subgroup that um, that difference was maintained. And that difference could not be explained by prior therapy um, or induction therapy for the myeloma, which was pretty similar across both arms. So it is very interesting that uh, another agent, another monoclonal antibody, which um, targets the microenvironment, which is, is primary aim is to prevent skeletal related events, may have some impact as an anti-myeloma agent as well. And so um, uh, this may mean that going forward, denosumab may become the um, agent of choice, which again, uh, emphasizes the importance of the immune system in, in myeloma. So that is my last slide. And um, I was fortunate enough to, to see Usain Bolt um, run in Melbourne. This was a year after he'd retired. He came here and did an exhibition event. And we waited for two and a half hours to see him. And when we 
uh, when we did actually see him, it was for a few seconds, but it was worth it, which was worth the wait. And I always think that's parallel to what we know about in terms of immunotherapy. We waited for more than 50 years to, to um, see these agents uh, in myeloma. And now they're they're taking off like you said, Bolters. And I think this next decade will be all immunotherapy in myeloma. Thanks uh, for listening, and I'm happy to take any question. Uh, yeah, thank you very much, Amit. That was uh, quite exhaustive and still um, a very lucid talk, which uh, summarizes uh, the things which are happening in this field. Uh, a lot of people have a difficult time. In, uh, there's an explosion of knowledge in myeloma as well as in solid tumors, uh, especially in immunotherapy. And people have been struggling hard to keep pace with whatever is happening. So uh, you've done really a good job in summarizing things uh, in this field. Uh, I don't think people have any question. I, it means either they have understood everything or probably they haven't understood <laughs> anything. Uh, oh yeah, we have one question. So do you, it's from Rohan. Do you feel that autologous transplant will be uh, pushed, uh, will be pushed to relapse setting in view of newer agents? That That is a, a, a question that gets asked every five years in myeloma. Um, so far, every trial uh, um, has proved uh, the benefit of an autograft, um, and uh, and and so I think for the next five years at least, uh, it's not going to change outside of the U.S. In the U.S., a, a lot of um, patients are choosing to have their autograft in the in the sort of relapse setting, but more everywhere else, I think it's still. Uh, part of the standard of care and frontline. And I don't think that's going to change at least over the next five to maybe even 10 years. The problem is that, as I said, I didn't get into the cost implications of all these treatments, which is a separate debate and a separate um, talk altogether. But um, unless a lot of these therapies um, become, they're, they're very effective, but the cost implications are going to be huge. So um, it's going to be um, a, a problem about, about how to fit them into the treatment paradigm. Now, with an autograft, I mean, my feeling is that um, if you get very effective therapy with, say, diatomumab, combine it with a proteasome inhibitor and an image, and you do maybe four or six cycles of it in combination with an autograph, the majority of patients are going to be MRD negative and may not even need maintenance therapy or if they need maintenance therapy, or short, or you may only choose to put those patients who are MRD uh, positive onto a maintenance regimen and try and get them MRD negative. A number of trials are doing that sort of response adaptive approach. So I think at least this is my personal opinion, is that uh, this combination of VRD anti-CD38 plus autograft offers the best chance of getting MRD negativity with a limited amount of treatment and not um, a treatment that um, goes on um, for years and years and which uh, in addition, which may be well tolerated in terms of side effects, but financial toxicity is huge uh, when it comes to um, uh, those sort of extended regimens. So, so I, I think I still think um, autograft will have a role to play uh, in the near future. All right, uh, Kinjal Shah has asked a question: uh, How to manage CRS? So that is um, uh, there are very good treatment algorithms um, that have been devised for the uh, in both the bite antibody space and the the CAR T cell space, um, the to, I mean the the in the bite antibody space, um, steroids are used much earlier, um, along with tocilizumab, um, um, but ma mainly the the algorithms are based on steroid use. In the CAR T cell space, um, it's tocilizumab first. If you're getting a sort of a, a grade two event which is not resolving, or a grade three or four event, then you use tocilizumab. Uh, one or two doses. 
and steroids are used as second line because they you, obviously you, you're using you don't want to use the lympholytic action to destroy the car t cells um, with the steroids but even that is not um, uh, fully understood or, or the the toxicity is not fully understood because there are some studies that i've seen which coming out of china which have been presented um, which have not used tocilizumab but have only used uh, steroids to manage uh, crs events um, and and also neurotoxicity events and they don't seem to have impacted significantly on response rates or um, progression free survival so um so yes there are very good um, um, algorithms which are standard algorithms which uh, are, have been developed for every product and and um, uh, mainly based on tocilizumab and steroids yeah the next question is about mrd uh, is post transplant mrd analysis uh, indicated in all the patients uh, we can extend this question to uh, non transplant patients as well and when is the best time to test for mrd and uh, another part uh, somebody else has uh, asked this question can mrd negativity be considered a good enough surrogate for pfs and os so the two questions combined so um that's a good question um so all trials all new trials now will always have mrd measurement built into them as part of the the assessments and uh, as i mentioned during the talk a lot of trials are now um, using mrd as decision making points so uh, based on so if uh, like one of the trials in the french group if you become mrd negative after an autograph then you have no further treatment and you get randomized against uh, uh, no further treatment versus um um uh, versus maintenance therapy or consolidation therapy or whatever you want to call it so uh, in in um yes in the trial setting every new trial will always measure it in in the practice setting it's more difficult question to answer i suppose if uh, um if you had if if your laboratory is experienced in looking at um, a, a flow cytometry mrd um and can measure it down to a 10 raised to minus 5 level then you 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 could argue that um, uh, if your patient has reached after an autograft has reached that level of mrd negativity uh, maybe maintenance therapy is not needed that's what the retrospective data seems to suggest the prospective trial data is will um, will mature over the next few years so we will definitely have an answer then um, but if if uh, if say somebody became mrd negative um, after an autograft um uh, and you they didn't want any further therapy in terms of maintenance i think there's a reasonable argument that could be made um uh um, about uh, not giving a maintenance therapy so i i i say if if you wanted to measure if there was one time point to measure it it would be after autograph um 3 months post autograph i would recommend um the in in the non transplant eligible patients um at this stage i think it's still a research tool i i don't think there is any indication for uh for for measuring it in outside of a clinical trial i think that uh, pretty much uh, summarizes the role of mrd and that that was the last question uh, thank you very much amit it was wonderful to have you with us uh, to talk about the recent advances uh, happening in this interesting field of multiple myeloma immunotherapy uh, we hope we will to have you with us sometime later uh, maybe um, next year if we uh, have a, look, a complete lineup till this year end but uh, i would expect you and invite you uh, for some talk next year on some interesting topic in hematology till then goodbye but thank you very much uh, thank you very much folks for joining us for this interesting talk we will meet next week on tuesday with another expert in another topic thank you very much and good night thank you thanks bye bye